Good afternoon and welcome to the Real Vision Daily Briefing. My name is Andreas Steno and I am finally back safe and sound from the Caribbean islands. And I'm basically buzzing to go live here on the 17th of November. Markets are actually still holding up all right despite all of the recession chatter. And therefore we're going to ask the question today whether a soft landing is still a possibility. And uh, with me to discuss that question, I have a great trader, a great friend and a great looking guy. So Tony Greer, <laughs> welcome to the show. Too kind, Andreas. It was great to see you in the Caymans. It was great to hang with all the Real Vision clients. They are some of the best people, and um, I'm privileged to be on this platform with all of you. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Tony. And it was great fun at the Caymans last week. But before we get to that question on the soft landing, I want your take on a market that you trade a lot. I know we've seen a pretty bearish price action in oil today. Uh, and I mean, being the energy guy number one at Real Vision, I wanted to get your take on the uh, oil markets first here. What's your take on the price action? It looks bearish to me. Yeah, you know, I get it. You have to say, um, <clears throat> Andreas, the technically speaking, WTI had a couple of chances to reverse, um, you know, the move off of the highs and, you know, and start attacking the highs again. And it was not able to do that, right? It failed at the moving averages in the low 90s. Um, when we saw that high of the range last week. This week, I think that it's responding to the credit markets, quite honestly. I think that it's responding to the fact that the curve is imploding to a new low. I think it's responding to the fact that five-year break-evens just traded from 2.75% to 2.35% in a straight line. I mean, I feel like the economy is saying that or the bond market is saying the economy is getting hit with so many rights. It's begging for a left at this point. So I think that that's what the weakness is in oil is in. Um, I do. It does look like a chance for a technical a bit of a breakdown where we could trade into the 70s. I don't think it's going to be a hellacious spill because we still got that situation where there's just not a big speculative position in oil. Certainly not to the long side. If anything, I would say that the book is probably tilted to the short side with everybody trying to play, you know, the economic weakness that continues to manifest itself on the screens. Um, what do we get today? We got today, we got housing starts. We're in line. Month over month was another miss for housing starts, minus 4%, expected minus 2%. So there's really, you know, there's economic deterioration and sort of signs of that kind of warning everywhere. So I can't be shocked that WTI is on its heels. Fair enough, Tony. You've been involved in this long energy trade more or less all year. So let me ask you, given the recent price action, are you still involved and how? Yeah, good question, man. Um, I, I, I no longer have any WTI crude oil futures. Um, as I postured to my clients, we sold those into the Ukraine, uh, Russia, Ukraine invasion um, on that spike. And I won't say we sold them at 130. But to me, that was my exit for the futures themselves, the crude oil futures that we had on. So uh, from there, I pivoted right into and in fact, I think I was already long some energy stocks at the time. That is the tactical trade, uh, the tactical gift that keeps giving, in my opinion, Andreas. So, yeah, when they're ending the year up 65, 70 percent, I'm going to stay in them down the stretch and see how they go across the finish line. Unless there's a major breakdown in crude oil or in, um, you know, the energy stock indices, uh, excuse me, energy stock ETFs, let's call them. But, you know, I don't try to outsmart the market, Andreas. I leave my trailing stop below the markets. And when the market gods come and get me they come and get me and I get out and that's it. <laughs> Tony, you've been involved in the refiners trade a lot this year as well. So let's get an update on whether you still like that trade. I think that's going to be, you know, whether or not, you know, E&P and oil services can hold up. I think that that's going to be a sort of linchpin sector for now, Andreas, in the energy markets, because the crack spread does not want to give in from you know around 35 which is you know where it seems to be the price that it's hovering around for the last several months it likes this level around here i think it's testament to the fact that you know diesel fuel is still in very short supply extremely tight um global oil demand is now back to where it was before covid levels so you know it's hard to make a case 
via energy demand that the global economy is weakening, weakening, right? We're probably going to see signs of it all over the place. But I mean, here in the States and certainly in Europe and probably some other countries, we've already seen it in China. But amazingly, oil demand doesn't seem to be backing off. So that's why I don't generally throw in the towel right now on the energy trade or the oil trade. I still think tactically that those sectors like refiners, where their margin is just really expanded from historical levels. And with oil demand being right there, they're set up for really good success in the earnings department. So, you know, as long as they continue to play that stewarding their stock price game, um, where they're beating expectations, they're run, running at really high capacity, they're running at massive, like 3 million barrel a day throughput, big ones are like Marathon Petroleum, um, you know, and they play the same game about buying their stock back and increasing their dividends. So, you know, down the stretch with a lot of other sectors really beat up on the year, I, I still think that the energy stocks are going to come out on top. And I think they're going to come out just fine, to be quite honest with you. Tony, both of us joined the Real Vision event at Cayman Islands last week, and it honestly didn't feel like a recession there, to be honest, right? So what do you make of this discussion on whether we can still get a soft landing with a strong demand for energy, etc.? That's a great point, uh, Andreas. You and I were uh, sharing some really nice time uh, out on a catamaran. You know, we had taken off from the Kimpton Seafire Resort. And that's probably not a great vantage point for a global recession, right? With a glass of champagne in our hand at 11 o'clock in the morning. So um, I would say, you know, are we going to be able to hit a soft landing? You know, I, I kind of have to let the markets tell me whether I can, whether we're going to do that. I'm really not an economist. I try not to, uh, I not to try not to be fatalistic about the Federal Reserve, even though uh, I do believe that really they. Jerome Powell comes out and sounds really unclear sometimes and does not breed confidence in what he's doing. Um, I try not to get too terminally um, bearish on their options. And, you know, it seems like right now they've done a pretty good job of slowing down the economy tremendously, not destroying the stock market too badly and having the bond market sort of find a level where rates aren't consistently flying higher and keeping their hands to the fire in terms of hiking rates. So like I said, while I'm not an economist and I'm not a great Fed prognosticator, it seems like they're off to an okay start right now. And you can probably blow some holes in that argument and I'd be wide uh, opening to listen to them because I don't have all the blind spots covered. But it feels to me like the S&P, you know, I'm not terminally bearish the S&P either. I've stated before, and I still think the low is in for the year. Um, if bond market, if the bond market can hold in at these levels, get through this crisis period without having a dislocation lower, where we see rates spike up 50 basis points or something like that in a super short period of time, you know, I think the Fed might be able to land this plane. I don't want to count them out of it anyway. <laughs> Well, I basically tend to agree, Tony. I think the setup is there at least for a short-term rally. And if you look at price action right now on an index level for the uh, S&P 500, for the Dow Jones, etc., one of the questions that we get all the time right now is whether this is a new bear market rally. What do you make of that? You know, uh, I, I have to consider, you know, speaking of Grand Caymans, you know, Jared Dillian shocked into my mind at uh, at lunch at Peppers one day that it could be the beginning of a bull market. Right. And that's just something that you can't count out as a zero probability because it's a market and we don't know what card unknown card the market's going to turn up next. So thinking of it. I have to assign some probability that 3,500 in the S&P was the low for quite a while and that we can see, you know, perhaps a 25, 35 percent rally from that price and start attacking the highs again. I'm still, however, in the camp, unless the S&P starts breaking the trend of making lower highs, which it has done since the beginning of the year, um, I'm still I still can't get bullish yet. You know, so it's wedging its way in my opinion, you know, it's 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 working its way into a wedge pattern, if that's fair to say, in my opinion, with the sort of descending highs coming down across the top and this flat bottom um, at 3,500, 3,600, which happens to be 
a 50% retracement of the lockdown low to the high we saw last year. So this would be a very logical place for a bull market to hold, right? So that gives you a little bit more of a leg to stand on if you want to say, yeah, maybe that was it for the sell-off. You know, so I don't like it. Right now, I'm really, really split. But tactically speaking, I'm definitely going to take a shot at selling a rally um, when it gets to the point that sentiment is swung all the way back into the bull camp and things look like they're extended into resistance. So I'm going to take a shot at that trade when I see it. I'm going to turn my book that's been long only for the last several weeks into a long short book, which is a lot more balanced, where at least I won't get killed if the market comes off. So that's how I'm thinking about things. Tony, let's assume for a second that this is actually the beginning of a new bull market. What would be some of the sectors that you would actually like into such a bull market from a technical and price action perspective? You can answer that question for me, probably, Andreas. I'm sticking with fossil fuels. Um, <laughs> you know, if if everything remains the same in that market heading into next year. It's going to be hard to consider how oil prices can really tumble very far, right? You know, I, I'm just in a predict. I'm in a situation. I, I kind of maybe that was a Freudian saying predicament, because I still feel like the downside is less attractive than hunting the upside in oil. You know, we're still coming out of this phase where Biden blatantly spilled the SPR into the midterms. Maybe it worked, and maybe it slowed the red wave down, or maybe it had some kind of effect or something. I have to think that in terms of being a politician and addressing optics, he might be on to the next in terms of spilling the SPR. So I, since I don't think that he is going to choose the option of refilling it, and I doubt that it's as politically important, I think that the sales might, there might be a reprieve in SPR sales. If there's a reprieve in SPR sales and output, uh, OPEC continues to cut output because of the weakening global economy, man, oil prices are still going to go higher because global oil demand is still there. So that's a sector that I'm still going to hang my hat on, Andreas, whether it's right, wrong, or indifferent, I still see the case for upside, especially given the refiner story that we just went over. But I don't want to be a one-trick pony. You know, the other sectors that I look at, you know, metals and mining is set up really well. If the dollar is turning here, and the dollar index to me so far has given all of the signs that the highs of the move are in, right? We had two central banks stick their chest out up there. That marked the highs. Price action has been steadily moving away from them and the trend has changed. If that's the case, I like the metals and mining sector a lot, right? If the, dollar st if the euro starts rallying and, some, and the dollar can back off, I think that it'll take a lot of pressure off emerging markets, a lot of pressure off the metals market specifically. And if we're going to green light go this transition to electric vehicles, you know, we've seen the list of, you know, metals and mining um, ingredients that have to go into it. Not all of them are the big main base metals, but man, we have to do a lot of drilling for lithium and cobalt all around the world. That whole hmm. scenario requires metal. And to me, that's still a bullish metals trade. So I'm still in the natural resources space, Andreas. I still believe that uh, even if this is another leg of a bull market, that rates are not necessarily going to turn back lower and sit on the zero boundary ever again. So I think the highs of technology are in and I'm not chasing that trade. I'd much rather trade chase something that's natural resources based, materials based, maybe industrials or even something cyclical at that point, because the economy is going to have to level off if the if we are going to head into another bull market, I think so. That's the case. Maybe you grab onto financials and you grab onto transports and things like that. But there'll be options for this trade. There'll be options for this trade and time to sort it out. I, by the way, perfectly agree with that takeaway for now, Tony. But I uh, wanted to ask you a couple of questions in relation to what you just said. You've been almost extremely vocal that the Biden administration is a part of the reason why you are so bullish on the energy resources complex, right? Now, after the midterms, what do you make of the political situation in the U.S. and the spillovers to this in, uh, long energy trade? So I, I've discussed that a lot, and this is my own opinion of reading the situation. I think that even with Republicans taking the House of Representatives, I, I don't think that that changes the political push towards you know back you know electric vehicles. 
right? I still think that the war on fossil fuels is likely to persist even through, even if there's a change all the way up to the White House, I think that it may take, you know, the green energy movement feels like it's happening and, and probably should happen at some level, just not at the speed and the pace that they're trying to push it at right now, because we, as you can see, we've got a lot of, uh, there's a lot of risk associated with that. So if the green movement is something that should probably live through you know, whatever 8% inflation we're living through now, you know, it looks like it didn't, the, the political pendulum certainly didn't stop when we hit 8% inflation on the move to electric battery power, right? You know, that's still happening. Those plans are still in motion. And I think if that's going to be the case, I don't know politically that, you know, that's the top of the agenda item. If the, you know, if our politics gets more balanced with a little bit more conservative input, you know, I still think that there's a lot more pressing issues that I don't want to go into because they're too political, um, but a lot more pressing issues than, you know, whether or not the, you know, green movement is causing inflation in the energy markets and whether or not people can deal with that. I just don't know that we're there yet. And so I think that I can stay with the, uh, the energy trade. I really can. The second question I have in relation to what you just said is the move that we've seen in the US dollar. Uh, I'm basically born and raised in Europe, so every time the dollar weakens, as we've seen over the past couple of weeks, it makes life easier for me from an energy perspective, right? Because I buy my energy in dollars by the end of the day. How important is this dollar move to your long energy view? You know, that's such a good point, Andreas, because you, you, you remind me that it plays into the economy as well as the trade, right? Even though, you know, the currency is bouncing and, you know, it makes things a little bit easier on you and, you know, and therefore by scale, other economies that are trading in other currencies, right? A weaker dollar, you know, props up their currency a little better and, you know, gives you a feeling of like, okay, you're, that's loosening the belt a little bit for you. So you can see how that feeds into the economic picture, which is one that I really hadn't considered very much. Um, you know, if that helps things, then maybe, you know, we have seen maybe they get a chance to pivot a little bit easier away from hiking rates. Um, that's the European side of the equation, I would say. It still feels like over here, given Bullard's comments today, which I thought were, you know, as hawkish as, as you could be um, saying blatantly that policy is not restrictive enough, right, using the word restrictive um, to fight inflation and that rates need to go higher. So I still think that, you know, when he mentions something like five to seven percent around here, that's going to be challenging for Europe to keep rates low um, over there on your side of the pond. So I do see how it feeds into the economic picture. Um, I'm still probably only capable of understanding it as a trade. And all I could see as a trade is higher commodity prices if the dollar backs off significantly. Makes sense, Tony. And by the way, if we look at it right now, the European Central Bank is so much behind the curve relative to the uh, Federal Reserve, right? And exactly. I think the best hint that we can get of a complete decoupling of the global cycle is if you look at the 10-year bond yield from China and the US, basically in opposite directions right now. So, I mean, Everything is torn apart when it comes to the uh, global cycle. Uh, but Tony, being a European, I'm very, very interested in the outlook for natural gas. We have kind of a scarcity. Currently, we have enough storage, but we are basically in the hands of Mother Nature for this winter in Europe when it comes to natural gas. So what do you make of the latest price action in natural gas? and sort of the spillovers to the uh, oil complex. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm really observing natural gas right now, Andreas. I don't have any risk on associated with natural gas. To me, the, 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 you know, the main story, obviously, as you said, and you were early to, was that they have enough storage for this uh, winter, it looks like, um, you know, unless Mother Nature really turns, you know, incredibly cold on them. Um, so the story will be, you know, between Europe and what, Russia, unfortunately, decides to do, you know, ahead of next winter. So I think that, the, you know, the Dutch TTF chart tells the story where the, you know, the crisis for, for now is certainly over. You know, we're back down to, you know, less unreasonable 
um, multiples of Dutch TTF gas prices and less unreasonable levels of um, European electricity levels. When I look over at U.S. natural gas, I see a chart that is definitely broken that you know, is not making any headway in terms of uh, stopping the curl over towards $4 that looks like it's coming. And that's a pretty strong read that I have, but I don't want that, that, that trade gets sort of knocked out of the box for me when it has so much geopolitical risk, right? I'm not gonna, even though natural gas, gas chart looks terrible, I'm not gonna go ahead and short it because I'm a headline away from getting my brains blown out and I don't really like that feeling. So, you know, I'm, I'm from a uh, spectator's perspective, like you said, you know, it's gonna be up to how mother nature feels this winter and how, you know, unfortunately Putin feels next spring, summer, when Europeans are probably trying to refill their supply again. And we'll see if there's enough there to not drive the price back up to $8, right? That's the only view that I can think of right now. Mm. And I mean, to me, Tony, there is basically a 0% probability that Europe will be able to import any natural gas at all from Russia next year. Uh, but enough about natural gas, because uh, I wanted to play a uh, soundbite for you from a discussion between Raoul Pal and uh, Juliette de Klerk from France on the possibility of a soft landing for the US economy, but also for the global economy. And quite interestingly, we have to call up a Frenchman to find someone willing to back up that soft landing uh, narrative. So Tony, let's listen to it and uh, get back to that discussion. She's a great one to ask, let's hear it. I'm, I'm still really like looking for soft landing uh, in the US. I don't see major vulnerabilities. I think the reason um, the, 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 the the economy is obviously a, a lot weaker, but not weak, is obviously the rise in in, in real rates and 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 the unprecedented um, rise in um, tightness in, in in financial conditions. So you know, for me, you can basically rebalance that pretty easily. So I'm I'm just talking for now, um, you know, for like a pause in hikes. I don't think we're going to hike as even after after yesterday's move. I don't think we're going to hike. Uh, as much as what's priced in the market, but I prefer to be long equities because I'm not seeing yet uh, the necessary forces to basically uh, start looking for cuts. The case for a soft landing in the US, that interview is already available at the Real Vision platform for subscribers. But back to you, Tony. I mean, watching the price action today, it kind of looked like a pullback in the S&P, right? So what do you make of the price action and that soft landing in the U.S. economy? Yeah, well, put it, well, put it this way, you know, Raul covered that with Juliet and we spoke about the soft landing before. So I want to talk about the markets a little bit today, Andreas. You know, it, uh, it, it, it was not shocking to me to see a little bit of a steeper pullback after that Bullard comment, right? Obviously, that's something that's very much um, on my mind. Um, when the S&P runs 15% off the lows right into 200-day moving average resistance, it's basically looking for a reason to pull back the first time, right? So we got close to the 200-day moving average last week at the high. We settled into the middle of the range, and then you have, you know, a St. Louis Fed president come out and talk 5 to 7% yield, 5% uh, to 7% interest rates. So he's talking about that while the curve is imploding, while break evens are imploding, doesn't shock me that that is going to shock the natural resources sectors in the markets. We see a pullback there today. You know, the only stocks that ended up in positive territory today, actually, it was a little rally at the beginning into the end of the day, but mainly it was solar stocks, um, semiconductors, aerospace and defense, retail came back, and then XLE Energy came back and landed in the green. But we still had the same usual suspects at the bottom of the rotation, Andreas, software, internet, Ooh. cloud storage, right? Um, today that joined them, we saw uh, gold miners, utilities, home builders, et cetera, which you would expect to be wildly affected by interest rate moves. So, you know, those sectors of the market, the usual suspects are still having trouble getting off of the lows. And even if you've been looking at those charts in like software or, um, Internet stocks, for example, I mean, these bounces aren't even big enough to get them through the first set of moving averages. So, 
you know, the, there's still a lot of selling going on in technology. And I really expect that to persist until year end or at least until the Fed has to pivot. Mm. Agreed. I'm a short Nasdaq as well, Tony. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions from the uh, audience. And we have a question from a member asking you, how much more will OPEC have to cut production in order to prop up prices of oil? Well, they seem to they seem to be at least willing to make cuts. I don't know really how much, you know, their last two million barrel per day cut seemed like a direct um tit for tat versus Biden announcing another SPR sale. Um, that seemed like the timing was very much in line with that. So, you know, if the economic data around the world continues to get weaker, I'm sure that they're going to sit there and say another two million barrels a day will be cut. And they want to produce they want to preserve, you know, um, fluid market prices or the word that they usually use or something like that. So. You know, I don't know how many barrels it's going to take to cut, but I do think that they do have interest in keeping oil at what they consider to be the real market price since they have people paying them the offered side for physical on the other side of the on the other side of their trade. And I can add that the price sensitivity of commodities is pretty low, right? So even in a recession, the amount of oils consumed per day is still relatively high compared to a normal scenario. Tony, we have another question from our member Pierre, and he's asking you for thoughts on the uh, anti-Russian oil sanctions going live on December 5th. Any views? They ain't bearish, right? If we're not going to get oil from Russia, that's going to be, you know, all it does is kind of rearrange the checkers on the checkerboard, right? If we're not going to get the oil from Russia, we're going to get it someplace else. If Russia's not going to sell it to us, they're going to sell it to somebody else. So I don't look at it as a massive imbalance. I just look at it as a sort of another, you know, another feather in the bull cap of the of the whole trade that can really give you the confidence to tr to play the energy from the long side when when you find a level or when it gives you the chance technically. I just think that, you know, cutting a major player and producer out of the market from any international level, all it does is shake up the supply demand partners and they go and find somebody else to buy and sell oil with. Mm. Uh, final question from our member, Paul, uh, and he's basically asking both of us, Tony, so I'll allow you to go first. Uh, has anything changed recently in Europe concerning turning any nuclear reactors back on? And what's your take on uranium as a trade? I'm bullish uranium. Uh, your Andreas, take it away from there on the European um, <laughs> on the uh, European nuclear story. You're much better uh, at handling that right now than I am. Sure, Tony. I mean, at least the Germans decided to sort of prolong the process of turning down the nuclear plants until April next year. And my impression right now from following German politics is that there is actually a willingness to prolong that date even further. But if we look at other countries in Europe, I actually find Poland to be the most interesting case. They've hired both a South Korean team and a US team to build two nuclear plants in Poland. Uh, with a time frame of, say, five to seven years. So slowly but surely, the tide is turning on nuclear in Europe. And I mean, even uh, seen from my spot in sort of the capital of wind turbines globally in Copenhagen, Denmark, I actually sense that the tide has turned when it comes to nuclear. So I perfectly agree with you, Tony. Uranium still looks like a uh, very decent structural bet. Uh, Tony, we are running out of time. Any final thoughts for the audience here? No, other than, um, you know, the one thing that I would, you know, finish that I would add about the S&P and the rotation and this pullback from the 200 day moving average, you know, my my point stands that that 3500 low is a good low for the year. So right at, right now I'm looking for a higher low to hold in. The low may have been, you know, in and around the 100 day moving average today. Right. I don't want to forget about the fact that we are just peeling ourselves out of the biggest negative sentiment bubble that anybody has ever seen and that it's perfectly logical for any market to fade on its first attempt at a 200 day moving average. But when I look back at the price action that we've already been through, 
I'm really confident that the next move in the S&P will be a higher low and we'll see what happens from there. So to sum up, Tony, you are still positive on the natural resource complex. You expect a higher low in the S&P, but you still expect this to be above the bottoms that we've already seen this year. So I guess this is basically bullish compared to the consensus, at least. Tony, it was a great pleasure to host you once again, and it was great seeing you on the show. So thanks for joining us. Always a pleasure, Andreas. Great job as usual, my man. Thanks, mate. Uh, I will be back tomorrow with uh, Warren Pies guesting the show. So thank you for watching the Real Vision Daily Briefing. See you tomorrow.